All right, so one thing we might want to do is set up our enemies so they can make decisions and find paths from one point to another under some certain conditions. We might have areas of terrain blocked out. We might have areas of terrain with some sort of associated costs. For instance, terrain which is hard to traverse or terrain which might damage an enemy as they walk through it, like lava or something. Um, I'm going to have a look at a few variations of this algorithm. Um, but to start with, I'll just quickly step through this. This is just a simple prototype to demonstrate the algorithm. If I run this, we can see a grid with a bunch of numbers. And these numbers are sort of the terrain cost, if that makes sense and we have two black points. So the goal is to start at this point and find a path to this point, which minimizes the terrain costs. Now just step back over that code super briefly. Why not? So here I'm defining some constants, types of um, terrain. Here I'm defining well, it's pretty self-explanatory, some colors, screen size, all of that, as well as this black color. And we set things up, create a font, create a surface to draw everything to. This blocks array is basically describing the terrain for our little demo. Then we have start position and end position in row column form. We calculate how large we want each block to be and create a generic rectangle to represent basically the size of a block. Then we go through our, um, yeah, our game loop and we, yeah, draw off the background color and then go through the list. And this code is drawing each of the blocks. We then draw the start position and end position. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it is pretty straightforward, but I just wanted to go through that because why not? So the first variation is sort of a brute force technique, and that is we start at this point here and we perform, in this case, breadth first search, which is we look around at our immediate neighbors. And then for each of those, we look at their immediate neighbors and we keep searching along. So this um, search region will sort of radiate outwards until we get to the end point. And this won't take into account the terrain costs or anything, it'll just do it. So let me just set this up. I am going to add another color here. And this is just being used to add a little bit of highlight to um, blocks which have been searched. Okay, that's all fine. So most of the coding is going to go on inside this part here. So first of all, I'm going to make a function to reset the state for the uh, search algorithm. So if we think about it, which, which variables are we going to use to run a search algorithm? Well, we'll need a set of um, positions that we want to search. We will need a set of positions which has already been searched because we don't want to go back and research the same things. And in addition to that, in order to, if I spelled that right, in order to recover the path, there are different ways to do it, but a nice straightforward way is to keep track of for every position, which position came before it. So then in order to search, you know, have we found the end, just say, hey, has the end position been registered as something which has a predecessor? And then recursively keep checking the predecessors until we get to the start position or something like that. So this is just a convenience. Another way we could handle it is by in history, storing a list of positions to track the path. But then the difficulty there is it becomes a little harder to see if something is in the history record. It's a, it's a little weirder. Anyway, so um, let's set those up and then return all of them. 
Alrighty, and then I'll just go down to the game loop. I'm going to be using this a little bit. And I'll say, I'll, let, let me just, let me just reset this to start with. Because this is a simple example, I am going to be um, messing with the scope of data a little bit. It's, it's fine. The same concept would apply if it was coded properly. So, yep, we go ahead and we run that automatically. And then I want to just set it up so that if I hit escape, I reset the board, the animation. And then if I hit space, I step through it. Okay, yep, so if we hit escape, then we'll go ahead and reset the whole state. Okay, so the next part is, well, we know how to reset the search. Now we need a function to step the search through one bit at a time. Now it is a little bit necessary to include all of these type hints because it makes it a little clearer later on when we start working with these data structures, which operations we can do, such as appending, checking things in a dictionary, and so on. For the moment, let's just pass and we'll return to that. Okay, um, so I'm gonna set this up so that if we hit Ah, that's not right. There we go. Yeah, if we hit space, then we step that search forward. Okay, so before I go back to the search, I'll just finish off this um, drawing code down here. So here we are doing all of this stuff. That's fine. Yeah, okay, so here we've just filled a rectangle with the screen's color, and then I want to check if the position that I just drew is something that I've already searched. So I'll just check if it's in the history, and if it is, then I'll go ahead and highlight it. And I do that by drawing with the, oops, wrong spelling, drawing with the gray color and specifying that going to additively blend. So that will just lighten it a little bit. Okay, so that's all well and good. That's highlighting the blocks which have been searched. Finally, I want to recover the path. So what I'll do is I'll go, okay. I'll start at the end position and then I'll keep searching while that position is in the dictionary. So if we haven't completed the path, then of course position will not be in the dictionary and the path will not be drawn. And then if we keep sort of stepping backwards and then we get to the start position, well, the start position isn't going to have a predecessor. And so that will terminate this. Okay, no worries. So we'll actually sort of do exactly the same as we have here. So we'll just say, okay, unpack this uh, based on the position and then get a copy of the rectangle, which has been moved to the appropriate position. And then, yeah, just fill it in with black. And then all I need to do is step back again. So I'll say position is look inside predecessor, get the predecessor of our position. Okay. Cool. So that's all the annoying nitty gritty done. We can actually go to the search algorithm. So back up the top. Okay, progress search. So one thing we want to do is check, um, basically check if we're done. So if the number of things which we have left to search is zero, another condition I guess is if the end position has something set for it. So if it's in the predecessor dictionary. And if that happens, I want to sort of print a debug message. So 
So by getting the length of the history list, that's giving us a sort of rough estimate, well, pretty good estimate of how efficient this algorithm is. Okay, so that's all well and good. Um, what I want to do is I want to get just the first thing on my on my list. So I'll say, okay, uh, this position, I'm going to look at the uh, to expand list, and I'm just going to pop the first thing that I see. Okay, and I'm also going to just put in some code to check this, maybe not strictly necessary, but a good idea. So if we pop something which has already been searched, then that's fine. Just pop the next thing and just keep doing this. But once we get to the end here, we have something unique. So send it to our history. So remember that we've just looked at it and then I'm going to need another function, basically the expansion function. So for a given point, I want to get the, the neighbors to that point. So I'll just to find this up above. So this is pretty straightforward. We'll unpack the row and column number, and then I'll just copy this over. So we want to look above, below, left, and right. We get above and below by adding and subtracting from the row number i, but we just want to check that against bounds because we don't want to go negative and we don't want to go out of bounds. And pretty much the same thing with the column number j. And then we just have these four variations are the four points left, right, above, and below. Okay, so that's fine. So what we want to do here is Okay, so I am going to add a few more validation checks. Well, actually, yeah. Um, so one thing we want to do is we don't want to do anything if we get a point which is already in our history, of course. Uh, but we also don't want to re-expand the same point. So we also want that point not to be in um, the to expand set. If we get that, then just continue with the next point. Otherwise, um, we want to record the path to that point, but um, only if something hasn't been recorded already. So we'll go, okay, if new pause is not in predecessor, then we say, okay, well, we got this new position as an expansion around this old position. So just remember that in our dictionary. So finally we get to the end and everything's fine. So we'll append that new position. And there we have it. So just as a, as a note, by default, we're popping from position zero by default, appending will append to the end. So this is making sure that we, or we can't append to the beginning. Otherwise, we'll keep successively searching the points that we just expanded. That's depth first search. Now, breadth first search is when the expansions sort of go to the end of the queue. So we're always searching from the, the least expanded point, if that makes sense. So hopefully this works. Let me just give this a shot. Okay, so if I press, oh, what's, what's wrong here? Uh, oh yeah, of course, of course we need to, um, what am I thinking? I'll just pass these arguments in and that should work. Okay. Yep, progress search based on that space. Okay, the state I mean. Okay, so as I keep pressing this, we can see these are coming onto our history. We keep searching these points. As you can see, it's sort of, searching outwards in all directions. So just give it a second. Come on. There we go. Okay. So it completes and it says, all right, we've done our thing and we checked 67 times. But as you can see, some of this may be not necessary. I mean, it's logical. The brute force approach often is logical, 
but we can improve it. So the next question is, how do we incorporate the terrain costs? And it's actually not too bad. So I'm just going to import something. I'm going to import heap queue. Okay. And then I'm just going to go down. The cool thing about um, making priority queues based on heap queue is we just use lists. So let's say to expand is just a list. And then we go heap queue module, heap push. And it takes basically the list that we want to push to. That's the to expand list. And then the item we want to push. Now that item we can put on a, a tuple. So we'll have a cost of zero and the start position. Because we're starting there, by default, it has a cost of zero. Okay, so that's all well and good. We can close that and then have a look at the progress search function. So here we're saying position. Okay, now what we can do is instead of doing this, instead of popping from position zero, we can look at the heap queue module and it's this heap pop. Now by default, this is a priority queue, pops the smallest item. So we'll go um, to expand is the list you want to pop from, but that ret returns a tuple. So the cost is the first argument and then the position is the second argument. So we can pop that there. Okay. So what I want to do is just modify this line down here. So I'm going to get the cost of the current, that new position there. So I'll just call this new costs. If I look at my blocks and then it's just index into this. So I'll go new pause zero, new pause one. Okay. So then we just go, alrighty. Um, heap Q, heap push. We're going to push onto the to expand. I'm going to push a tuple. The cost is the original cost plus the cost of going to that, that new block. And as this progresses, the, the, um, the keys will start to store a progressive cost of all the steps to get there because we keep adding on. Um, I'm going to go new pause. And yeah, fingers crossed. So let's have a go at this. Remember the last execution took about 67 steps. So let's give this another shot. Okay. Now, as you can see, we're not strictly expanding outwards. I mean, yeah, we sort of are, but we're avoiding the terrain. So just keep going. See, we're avoiding the terrain until we get to a point where we say, hey, this is a pretty far distance. So we might want to start looking at the terrain and then we keep going. Bada bing, bada boom. That took 57 checks. So this has improved the algorithm. So that's all well and good. But what we might want to say is, hey, why are we expanding out here when this is obviously so far away from the goal? And this is where there's a third component and this is what really makes it the A star algorithm is we have the terrain cost plus I'm going to define a cost heuristic, a distance heuristic, which in this case is going to be the taxi cab distance between these two points, but it could be anything. Um, we could use any state variables we have available to add additional heuristics. So let's pop in. And I'm just going to make a function up above. We're going to call this heuristic cost. I guess we can know. Uh, oh, don't worry about that. It'll, it'll either return a, f a float or an int, something like that. Now, by the way, if you're not familiar with this um, lingo, a heuristic is any sort of rule of thumb estimation function. Um, and as it turns out, the more fine grained, so the more components there are to a heuristic, 
generally the more accurate and reliable it is. Anyway, so what I'm doing is I'm just unpacking this position, pos, is going to be the point that we're looking at, and this we're going to get the distance to the to the end point. So we want to return, let's go, the absolute value of the i separation plus the absolute value of the j separation. So this is called the taxicab distance metric. It's essentially just the, the sum of the x and y distances in absolute values. Okay, so we have that. Now I'm just going to go down, down here, and um, I'll say, okay, add that plus the, whoops, come on, it's not my day, plus the heuristic cost of that uh, new position. So now those points which are further away from the end point will be biased against, if that makes sense. So let's do this thing. So we expand outwards. You might see that beyond a certain point, we don't really branch out here. So we want to be distance wise, we want to be closer to the end point. I mean, yeah, we branch out a little bit. There we have it. But see, we definitely have not gone out as far as we were going before. The heuristic wants to keep us in the neighborhood of the end point. And as we can see here, we've gone again from 57 checks down to 49. Maybe not super dramatic, but it's an improvement. So there we have it. That's the basic theory of a star search algorithm for pathfinding. Now, you can essentially use this approach. It works. Um, the devil is in the details. And a lot of that comes down to how we convert our game world into a grid, which decisions we make there as well as, I guess, what our heuristic functions are. And then remember, this is just giving, this is just giving a path. Um, it's up to us how we interpret the um, execution of that path. Anyway, so that was it, just a quick one. Uh, see if I can incorporate this into my running project. And yeah, all the best. Hope you learned some stuff and I'll see you again soon. Bye.